a little bit about my uh, journey from a classroom that looked a lot like this to, to a space that looks more like this and how uh, you guys are probably in a unique position to, to kind of go into classrooms and make this happen and how it's beneficial to you and it's beneficial to young people as well. And it all kind of starts with this program problem that people are talking about constantly, that we are becoming uh, very dependent on machines and algorithms, and, and that's kind of obvious. But at the same time, I don't think that young people are what we call digital natives. I actually think that their understanding of code and what makes these machines tick and how algorithms work and what is possible and what isn't is kind of on the decline. Uh, so these are kind of, you know, you know uh, stats that I gathered from code.org that is trying to bring awareness uh, about this. And, you know, it looks like in America not enough schools teach computer sciences, and it's, it's kind of hard to know whether when they say they're teaching computer sciences, uh, they are teaching it. Here in Israel, many schools do teach computer sciences, but it seems like they're teaching it to very particular students in a very particular manner. Um, and there's a bunch of standardized testing that you have to pass that I'm not sure uh, does the right job at selecting people for this. So, you know, there's also this kind of embarrassing infographic that I came across that, that we can kind of see that, that there are not enough women pursuing computer sciences and it starts in school and it kind of carries directly to universities and then to the workforce. And I think it's humbling to see the work that people like Django Girls are doing and Rails Girls and those organizations. Economically, this is kind of a bad thing. We know that there are not enough developers. There's talk about as many as, you know, a million unfilled computer science related jobs in the States alone. I don't know what that means specifically. And also there's talk about whether a dependency on few people to solve very trivial algorithmic problems is, is problematic. I mean, this is a picture of a scribe. And back in the day, you needed this guy to get reading done, to solve your reading problems. And while we're not all professional writers, we, we can kind of solve our our day-to-day -day reading and writing, you know, problems. And, and so it seems like we're going into to a generation that doesn't really know how to take care of things that they should. So we know why the demand is growing. There's more computers in our, in our homes, in our pockets, in our cars. But, but why is the supply shrinking? We think about it, there are kind of two main suspects. I mean, when we were young, less people had access to computers, but when you turned on a computer, you were faced with this command line and it, it threw a bunch of errors at, it, at you and you had to punch some code into it because nowadays when I teach young people code, when you know, the, the computer throws an error, they kind of throw this big fit and they run across the, the, the room like, what just happened? I, the computer said I, I did something wrong. It, it, it's not good. So you know, the command prompt is now this really nice GUI and yes, they're really good at using it, but so, so are my parents, and I don't think this makes them uniquely, you know, digitally native. Another thing is that back in the day when your phone broke, you would get a little bit excited about, you know, opening it up and, and hacking it together and the opportunity of fixing things. And I feel like when my phone breaks now, I'm, I am a little bit happy, but it's because of the opportunity for, for an upgrade. And it's kind of this secret, you know, uh, joy that you have. And, and so you have kind of an ease of use that is, that is created by, by GUIs and abundance, which, which are good things, I think. Uh, but they, they might be causing a cultural problem-solving degeneration. And, and cultural problem-solving degeneration does not really bring to mind like a, an army of amazing developers. And so uh, the education system knows this, and if you've 
been around schools lately, you know that code has become a big buzzword in education, and there's code, 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 and talk about code this and code that. And it's equated with science, which is great, and it's, it's equated with better income and upward mobility. They, they show a lot of really cool workspaces. Even though I'm not sure that's a great way to get people excited about stuff, it's kind of extrinsic. And there's talk about equating code with programming, and, and yes, it's odd that I'm mentioning that, but I think there's so much more to it. But, but I think there's not a lot of, of talk about this, you know, code and creativity and code and self-expression and code and problem solving. And I suspect, you know, having been in the education system, that this is because it's kind of hard to produce numbers around things like creativity. You know, standardized tests give us really nice numbers. When you're teaching things that have to do with making, you don't have the numbers to show for it, in a sense, or compete with the next school. And so I think that uh, the Python community has this kind of unique supportive nature to it. And I also think that this language and this ecosystem really stresses the human part of the equation when it comes to software development. Uh, but I'm not here to, to tell you to write to your congressman or if you live around here to your, to your Ministry of Education to, to get Python in the classroom. I'm kind of telling you to, to take things to your own hands and find a school and do the right thing and, and code with uh, the younger generation. So uh, my name is Roni Sher. I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm part of a small startup here in Tel Aviv. We were producing a learning management system that, that tries to get out of the way of teachers, which is rather challenging, or seems to be. And we're a proud Python and Django shop, even though we, we do a lot of things with JavaScript these days. Uh, you can check us out. It, that, that's a little plugin at Simplified LMS. Um, and uh, about a year and a half ago, I came across these people and, and this school. This is uh, Ram Cohen and his assistant principal, Hasi Ram. He's kind of this legendary slash controversial figure in Israeli education. Uh, it's kind of like cilantro. You either you know, like his approach or hate it, but it's hard to stay naive to. And they got together this team of, of amazing teachers who are Jewish, Arab, gay, straight, secular, religious, it's one of the most diverse crews of people that I've seen, and decided to form a school that kind of evaluates every day of, of what is a school and, and what are we supposed to be teaching in, in this time, in the 21st century. And uh, the answer seems to be making stuff. And they, they gave me this kind of simple challenge. They said, take, take a class of 27, you know, ninth graders, that's 14 years old, and divide them into, they said, three startups and teach them meaningful software development. Now, uh, how many of you have seen a school in the last few years, have children, siblings? I, I hope that if you've seen a school, you're either a teacher or, or you know, have children. Uh, and, you know, if you've been in a school lately, this is kind of your reaction. Like, how do you get students psyched about code? How do you get students psyched about anything within a, a school context? And I guess the short answer is you teach making and you teach problem solving, but, but you don't teach programming and coding. And so that seems to work. And uh, the good news is that Python is really perfect for this. I really think it's superb. And the bad news is that Python is not the official language of our computer science core curriculum, or, or to that effect of many of them. Uh, C Sharp and Java are the official languages of the computer science uh, curriculum. And I don't, I don't have anything against C Sharp and Java. Like some of my best friends are C Sharp and Java. Uh, but I do think that it's hard to get down to what's important, I think, algorithmically. And, and this really is, you know, brings it home. You're, you're trying to teach a student the, the kind of you know, rite of passage, putting out to, to, to a console. Yeah. Hello world, and then an amazing question arises, which is what's a class 
Hello World app. And, uh, and you have to do something which is extremely, extremely demotivating. If you've learned stuff lately, you have to say, well, ignore that class Hello World app thing because it, it, that it's not relevant. It's too, too complicated for now. You, you'll find out about it later. And by the way, I, I think you're not really required to teach object-oriented. So you, they might be finding out about this you know, in college. You know, they, they oh, try me. I could pick it up. Try to explain to me in 10 seconds. I can get this thing. And eventually, you win this battle onto what is public. And again, don't worry about public. You don't have to explain to you what's static and void and main. And you do want to explain string. And you say, well, a string is, but what is a class? It's very hard, and then it finally gets to this kind of thing, and by this point, you've exhausted a lot of cognitive resources, because I think being told not to worry about stuff uh, really exhausts people mentally. And, and a, lot, a lot of classes kind of you know, copy-paste boilerplate and get down to algorithms. And I, I, I personally think students should go home and, and be able to show people what they've learned. So we have the, the ultimate kind of, you know, get down to business, but when pendulum swing, they tend to swing all the way. And there's another school of thought that says, well, this language also has, you know, a get down to business. And I, I agree. And, and this language has a great argument because it's the, the language of the web and it lives in the browser. That's kind of, have you ever imagined like a language living in a browser? Or is that just like, I enjoy programming in JavaScript for odd reasons. But, you know, you can get down to business, but very quickly it turns into this. Like, when you get to this, it turns into this, if you've done JavaScript lately. And, and when I enjoy programming JavaScript, it's a lot like when I enjoy making it through these uh, games of, of rigged Mario that, that I, I'm oddly addicted to. I feel like I've predicted an unpredictable behavior. And once again, I, I don't think this language should be looked at lightly. I think people should really get deep understanding of what it brings to the table. And I, 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 once again, this should not be taken as me kind of showing off ignorance. I think we should all be learning it. And Python works, and I think that white space, it, it, you need it for code to run, and so control flow has to be there on the pay, on the on, on the screen, and, and this is really helpful because to teach somebody to indent as a best practice is a really hard thing. I don't know if you've taught code before. Teaching best practices is much harder than just saying, hey, if you don't do this, it's not going to work. And so, and so, and so it reads, and, and more importantly, and I think much more importantly, you, you can build what I consider meaningful software within a lesson. When I say meaningful software, I mean software that solves a trivial problem. And it's something like this. This was actually written by one of my students, untouched except for the ellipses, because you don't need to see the whole YouTube URL. And this prompts a student to take a break every 30 minutes by playing their favorite YouTube video. And so you don't have to kind of awkwardly explain to them that they're assigning you don't have to make these metaphors of, hey, imagine a parking space or a box. You can actually say, look, in 30 minutes and you're assigning variables for a purpose within a lesson, and that's very powerful. Some of your fellow students know this, but loops are the point where some people start to think that this was a bad choice for them. I, I, I have family who's taking the matriculation exams, and this is where they second, and here this totally makes sense. By the way, notice how this is kind of a really sugar-free uh, syntax for incrementing, which, yeah, it might look silly, but this, to this rocks. I mean, of course, break count means break count plus one after each time the computer does that, and totally makes sense. Now, the skeptics, uh, people that haven't interacted with young people in a long time, would say, well, there's an app for that, and they probably like using that app, and I would say that my students use this all the time because we are biased to like things that we have made. 
That's why people like baking, cooking, or shopping at IKEA. Like you, you, you're oddly attached to that kind of lame furniture because you had a, a, a hand in making it, and you feel like you're you're part of the the making effort, the creative effort. So, so my students take this very seriously, and actually, the coolest thing happened about about uh, five lessons into our course, a student came to me with a command line version of tic-tac-toe, and that's pretty freaking cool, and he insisted that I play it through the end, and, and it's amazing. I, I, yeah, they, they have, you know, Minecraft, but command line tic-tac-toe is what he made, and when you make something, you're, you're attached to it. Uh, initially, by the way, I, I did the traditional classroom thing, which is a lot like this, which you come and you yap for 45 minutes and then you send them home to pretend like they did something and come up with an excuse about why they did it. Then I was introduced to something called the flipped classroom, where um, you create these little tutorials, it's a little bit of work for you, uh, video tutorials or written tutorials, and you tell them to go home and, and just watch the tutorials which they usually do. And then in class, you kind of work alongside the students. So it's flipped because they do the homework in class and the classwork at home really works. And I think this is where education is going to go. I don't think we're going to not have schools. But then there's like 27 of them, and that's what you're going to get from the education. Even if they promise you like eight students, they're going to throw a bunch at you. So there's 27 of them. There's one of me. Oh, my god. I you remember when you heard a teacher say that and it was agonizing? Anyways, I, I had to deal with this situation. So I, I, uh, I found people who sort of knew stuff. Like, I, I kind of got a sense of whether somebody was about to figure something out. They don't have to totally figure it out. And then I made them teacher. I was like, hey, go teach this to everyone. And then they get really serious, they finish learning it, and then they master it by, by going out there and teaching it. And this is what happens, and this is cool. I just, there's like two smartphones at sight, and, and students are looking at code. And this also battles the kind of notion that, you know, when we bring computers into to classrooms, we're creating these zombie students, because we know that there is more to this, that this is about human interaction. If you look at this picture, you see students interacting with students. And actually, if you teach in a structured way how pair programming is done, I think it's, it does wonders, and it can teach kind of mutual respect and empathy. Like, don't, don't immediately jump to criticize, because you, you got to make somebody feel comfortable with you looking over their shoulder. And I think this is, this is wonders. But when, when we oversimplify it, I think it, it, we kind of live up to the stereotype of, of zombie students. Anyways, I, I wanted to talk about this. There's a book that I haven't read by this guy named Dan Pink, but I saw the TED Talk and I totally agree with it. And he says that motivation is derived from these three pillars, these three fuels, and it's autonomy, and it's mastery, and it's purpose. And when you're making stuff, you feel a sense of, of freedom from it, and you derive a sense that you're getting better at it because you're doing things, and you feel like you're part of something that's bigger, a sense of purpose. When you're taking standardized tests, you do not. I mean, you might be getting some mastery if you're an incredibly disciplined person, uh, but, but I think that uh, at the end of the day, the autonomy part is gone and the purpose part is gone and, and there's a weird kind of setup that's about fooling people. And Finland actually dropped testing as a means of giving scores to students and they actually beat other countries uh, at you know standardized testing, so I, I think this is really amazing. Scope reasonably. So when I asked them what they wanted to code, they said like things like self-driving cars that talk to each other and things like that, which is another problem because dream big is something kind of overdone in education, and I actually think that dream small and achieve those dreams is really powerful, and it's not done all too often. Which brings me to Douglas Crockford. He wrote a really nice book about JavaScript, which I have read, the good parts, and he said that programmers are irrational and emotional people. The problem is we grown-up programmers are really good at hiding emotions and irrational 
behavior. But young people are not, and this is really cool because you get to see like a magnified version of how people interact with code. One of the things that particularly struck me as interesting is rewrites. Like within a few lessons, people started approaching me, wanting to start projects over for very lame reasons. And we do this because we like this like tabula rasa. So you, I, I actually learned how to talk people out of rewrites. It's like, uh, let's sit down and reason about your code for 10 minutes. And I don't know if it bored them to death or really made them realize how much work they've put in, but it works and I've, I've tried it with grown-ups and it also works. This can go into education too and you have this and you can share this and you can teach teachers this, which is like agile like stuff. So I don't like bells in classrooms, we don't have them in the school where I teach, but I think we tell them like try to work on one thing uh, for uh, at the time. That's kind of vague. Pomodoro technique is cool because it's 25 minute intervals, five minute mandatory break. It's really hard to get them to walk away from code. So I kind of play loud music and then they have to. And it works and it makes them think outside the box. And, and you know, you, I got actually each, each day we have a, a group volunteer to put their Trello board on the big screen. And then other groups freak out and try to catch up. Another thing that you have that is under taught is that you are some of the best Googling people. I'm not gonna say Googlers, because that's like copyright, right? You are some of the best like Googling people in the world. You know how to solve problems with Googles like really effectively and they need this and they're not taught that because that's like cheating. So just bring that to classrooms and that's amazing. I should give a kind of fair warning because in, I think in open source, software projects and, 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 you know, and kind of enterprise, we sometimes don't let people see that we see that they work and we have grown accustomed to that as adults. But with young people, that's like one of the most devastating things. So that's kind of like the catch that if you can't acknowledge work being done all the time, you shouldn't go into it. Things can really grow if you teach basic version control. Don't shy away from it. Get it in there as soon as possible. Like don't do like branches and remote, like don't go crazy with it because they'll learn it, but that's like all they're gonna learn and they're gonna focus on the tool, but basic commits really work. And uh, they've, they're doing like Django projects now and they're almost at production. There's one group that's doing a movie rating site that has to be outside of Facebook in their opinion. Like it can't be a Facebook group because that way there's no corporate influence and that's like 14 year olds talking about this stuff in classrooms. And uh, finally, just shout outs to people who are humbling and inspiring and I think that Django girls just do an incredible job and just watching their work is uh, you know, humbling and also there's Scratch for younger people that stresses creativity. I, I see my seven-year-old niece programming and making stuff, makes me happy, and this community. So finally, I just want to leave you with this challenge that if you live around here, you should come code with, with us. If you don't, you should go to a school and, and if you put it nicely, there's no reason why they won't let you. They, they do look up to professionals and people from the tech industry. So they'll, they'll let you do this and you can kind of save people from, from missing out on a skill, that, on a talent that they have, which I think is tragic, if that makes sense. Are there any ways to change the fixation on Java and C Sharp? For some awkward reason, they believe that they're feeding a workforce and in some countries, other forces. And so the curriculum is scoped, if you know what I mean? Curriculums are scoped around that. I believe that when they realize that like MIT is doing it and now some other universities, that might change their mind because they, they are, I, I hate to say the education system, I'm gonna get in trouble can be like groupies to academia. So this, it's a good thing that it's changing at that level. But I think uh, if you bring it into classrooms, people are gonna see that it makes sense. Like, and, and so you'll have, you kind of make things happen and, and things follow. I would actually, if you're writing like a letter to a principal, tell them that you heard that the curriculum is gonna be Python, just fly to them, and then, uh, and then maybe they'll let you teach it and then this will happen. Our school doesn't do iPads because uh, we evaluate stuff, but a lot of schools are bringing tablets. 
that's pretty horrible because we have like angry birds delivery mechanisms in classrooms. It's, it's a consumption device. With that said, you need a, com a room with computers. And so while my students are using their computers, you might have to go to a cloud platform like Cloud9 or things like that. Um, a computer room, that's, and every school should have one, and now you have, to, like the iPads failed, so they have the laptop cart, that's the new thing that, that goes around, so whatever it is now, they, they'll have a keyboard. Mobile app develop, what about mobile app development? Uh, there's a really neat platform called App Inventor that I've seen really cool and nice things coming out of. I do really like the web, because it's like, they can build something and then it reaches outward. But maybe that's me overthinking it. But whatever you can bring to platforms. Uh, I know there's Kifi, but I can't say anything more about it because I've never used it. Where do, the question was where do they find answers for, for questions they have after hours? Uh, because a lot of the resources are in English. So actually, this is a good challenge because when you have a reason to learn a language, you're very motivated to learn it, and as opposed to just drilling, you know, drills. Uh, I get emails all the like they email a lot, like <laughs> they, are, they get really neurotic, like about quite they paste like code. They're really like grown ups. It's weird. Like they they send me like screenshots and all these. Error, error messages, but it's unfortunate. So the, the, the question, question is, what is a good age to teach? Because uh, there's these weird people saying college starts in kindergarten, and that's not true. Kindergarten really starts in kindergarten. So they're trying to teach really odd stuff. I think that if students speak English, it's a little bit earlier, but I would say probably around fifth grade, sixth grade, we're teaching ninth grade because at ninth grade they know English, and so they can understand you know, different things. Uh, they know some English, uh, but I think it's individual, and I would love to see people try different age groups and seeing how it works. And actually, I don't think we're limited to visual languages in young age because they learn stuff really quickly. Like I think they can equate an if statement to an if block if they do it like 10 times when they're really young. First language, Python or JavaScript? Uh, it's a hard question. I think Python, absolutely Python. I, I, I have to say it because I think that I, I have a tremendous amount of JavaScript, and I think that when when peop, that people don't understand the complexity of it, and I think that just like Java and C sharp enforces, you know, you know, very very. I would say complex constructs. JavaScript is kind of like an iceberg when, when you do have to understand a lot of stuff before that, that is going on beneath your code, if that makes sense. Python, you know, straight line code is straight line code. With JavaScript, when I define something, it answers to a prototype chain, and that's a lot to worry about, and that's a behavior I'll have to explain in lesson five. You know, so I can log things to the console, but it's complex. I don't, that's the thought that just came to my mind, so it might be totally wrong. The question was, do I notice more interest in things that are, you know, command line programs as opposed to, uh, as opposed to more complex visual things? So we're doing Django apps. And it's, you know that saying, like you can have any car as long as it's a black car? So it's like you can build any app as long as it's a CRUD web app, and that's a lot of options. So I think that's a realistic goal for a year's work, but I think they can really get invested in command line stuff. Jonathan said that, uh, that Kiwi should be uh, explored because you can easily kind of create things that are graphical and run on touch devices. I, I don't have experience with Kiwi, so I don't, you know, I, I, I don't uh, feel comfortable recommend, but if you think so, then I'll try it out. And also, like, tr like, we try stuff and it fails. Like, teachers can try stuff and, and fail as long as you kind of have this approach, like, we're trying this together. Like, I didn't want to try Git because I was afraid it w wouldn't work, but they wouldn't get stuff done because they would get too nervous about messing with code, and they would have a hard time kind of picking up where they left off. So 
think take risks in classrooms. I think it's this kind of risk-free approach to education. Horrible. Uh, that's the cool thing about Ram Cohen is that uh, they've, they've tried to fire him a bunch of, of times and couldn't. So now he just does what he wants. And <laughs> Is so like uh, for, poli for political reasons, this principal is known for having been, you know, they, they've tried to remove him and didn't weren't able to make the case. So there's more freedom in our school, and so we don't answer to standardized testing. And also, I purposely went to middle school because in high school we have matriculations and we don't learn stuff. We learn how to pass tests. Is that it? Thank you very much. Enjoy Captain America. I hope I was a good enough opener.